have this little uh, situation with my wife sometimes. My mind, I don't know if I have a strange mind. You might say that I have a strange mind. But when I'm talking with my wife, all of a sudden my mind goes in different directions. And I'll go to this, which takes me to this, which takes me to this, and which takes me to this. And I will tell her, and oh, by the way, let me explain this. And I say, I know we were talking about this, and I just told you this, but you'll have to trust me that everything fits together, even though it looks like these two points do not. Sometimes when Paul tries to put this letter together, I have the feeling that he goes from one topic to another topic and another topic. And maybe in his mind, it's a logical progression from this, which leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this. But sometimes to the reader, you look at that and you say, I see this, and I see this, but Paul, what were you thinking in between here? I mentioned those things because we have a short little section in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, that just seems to kind of fit here in the middle. We're almost at the middle of this letter, and it's almost as if Paul just takes a break from his thought to say, I want to simply remind you about this. And at the end of that reminder, he breaks into praise and worship again. If you recall me saying in one of our previous sessions that sometimes Paul just can't seem to contain himself, that the glory of God and the message of the gospel overwhelms him, that he breaks into this song. But I think what we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, is just a short little example of Paul kind of cutting right to the middle of it and saying this, Timothy, this is what I want you to know. So if you take your Bibles and look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'd like to read verses 14 through 16. 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 16, it says this, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. That's it. That's his little short section. But it's as if he pauses in his thought to say, Timothy, I really hope to come back again. I want to see you soon. I hope we can meet up somewhere, but Timothy, I want you to know why I have written this letter. I want you to know that if I'm delayed, one might know how one ought to behave in the household of God. In the first century Jewish home, there were house rules, that there was a code of conduct of how the home would operate that whether it was a common understanding or written down, I honestly don't know, but it's talked about in a couple of different places in the New Testament, these house rules. And what Paul is giving to Timothy here, he says, I want you to know the house rules of how someone should conduct themselves in the church of God. Because you recall, if you've been tracking with us through this study, that there's problems in these churches. The worship services are disoriented and chaotic and some issues with the man not having a quality relationship with God so they can pray. Issues with the woman, women and the way that there was distractions in the church and roles that they were trying to usurp. Uh, uh, prayers for each other, prayers for the nation and the nation's leaders. Uh, false teachings were coming in, the lack of godly leadership. And so Paul had to spend time talking about elders and deacons and deaconesses or, or the wives of the deacons and saying, Timothy, I'm writing all of this so that you can set these, this house in order, that there are these house rules. For example, in our home, we don't have a list of rules of what it means to be a part of our family. There's just a common understanding that our children know that they will conduct themselves in a certain way and that certain behaviors will not be tolerated. That if one of our children is excessively angry or throws a temper tantrum or doesn't do a task that they were asked to do, that there are consequences. I don't impose my rules on other people's homes, nor do other people impose their rules upon me. These are the house rules for living in the Bruce and Trudy Dick household. Paul is doing the same thing here. He says, as there would be in a Roman or a Jewish home, a code of conduct, he says, Timothy, this is what I have tried to show you. 
things about prayer, things about problems, things about conduct in worship services. He says that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And I love this description, which is the church of the living God. In contrast to the Roman culture with its pantheistic observance of all different kinds of religions and the service of different gods, he says, listen, we are the church of the living God. He is true. He is righteous. He is just. He is alive. His son, Jesus Christ, died, but he rose from the grave. There is no other God in the universe on this planet or anywhere that is like him. He is alive, and this church is the church of a living God. As I look across the landscape of what I see in our country and around the world, I see people struggling with that notion of which God should I serve. And in our particular culture, it's becoming a very, I think our word for it is syncretistic. In other words, you can take a little piece of this religion and 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 you blend it into whatever individual form of worship or God you want. Paul says, that's not what I'm about, Timothy. We are the church of the living God. His descriptions are, he says, a pillar and a buttress of truth. And when he said the word pillar, I think I know what Timothy and his readers were thinking. The temple to the goddess Diana. We had talked about that temple a little bit, but there was a little nugget of truth that I didn't share with you. This temple had amazing pillars of marble. Do you know how many? 127 pillars. Each of them were 60 feet tall. I'm about six feet tall, two meters tall. You would take 10 of me stacked on top of each other to reach the height of one of the pillars that head up, held up the magnificent roof of this incredible temple. And 127 of them, one after the other, after the other, after the other, around this magnificent building. No wonder it was one of the wonders of the world. Paul said, you know what? In that temple, they think they're holding up a roof or a structure to a worship of this goddess. But he said, Timothy, I want you to know something, that we are the household of God. We are the church of the living God. And the church is the pillar and the buttress or the foundation of truth. So many people then, as they are today, are saying, what is truth? Where can I find truth? Truth is whatever I want it to mean. Truth is truthful for you, may not be truth for her. It might not be truth for you, but it's not truth for me. And Paul says, listen, Timothy, the church is the foundation. It is the pillar of truth. If you remember when Jesus Christ was on the earth, in John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me that Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the pathway. And his story and the gospel message of Jesus Christ is woven in this book, in 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. This contains the truth of who God is, his glory, his gospel, his message to the nation and to each individual. And, and Paul is just, as he's writing this, I'm imagining that he's getting more excited with each word that he is penning on this particular parchment that he's writing. You say, how do you know that? Because of what happens next. If you notice in your Bibles, and I'm not sure if it's this way in Russian as it is in English, but you see the difference between prose and poetry by the way the sentences are structured. And in my Bible, it shows six short little phrases. There are three couplets of ideas, and we don't know if Paul wrote this himself as a brand new contemporary song, or if he had borrowed it from somewhere else, but he describes three different facets in two lines each of what he is exalting in who Jesus Christ is. The first two say this, He, meaning Jesus Christ, was manifested in the flesh and vindicated by the Spirit. Those two things speak of Jesus Christ being revealed. He was manifested in the flesh, the human side. He was vindicated by the Spirit, the spiritual side. He is the Almighty Lord and Savior and Messiah. He had witnesses who saw Him. That becomes the next couplet. He was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among the nations. 
He was seen by angels. The angels had the privilege of seeing Jesus Christ in all of His glory before He came to the earth. And then when Jesus Christ was born, they had the privilege of announcing to the shepherds the birth of this little baby that was the Son of God, that was going to be the Messiah, that was going to save, that was going to pay for the sins of the world. And this became proclaimed among the nations. It started in the little hillside outside of Bethlehem to the shepherds. It spread from there into Bethlehem and then into Jerusalem and throughout Israel and eventually throughout the Mediterranean world. And today that gospel message is spreading to all the ends of the earth. In fact, I was reading some things recently that we happen to live in the generation in which they believe that the, the gospel, the Word of God, is going to be translated into every known language group in the world. And that's going to happen in our lifetime in the next 30 years. Can you imagine that? That the time in which we live today is unique. It has never happened before in the history of the world. That this book and its message and the gospel and the living Jesus Christ is going to be translated into every known language group in the world in our lifetime, unless the Lord should come. And I go, praise God. Praise God. His last couplet in finance, stanza number three talks about the reception, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. Believed on in the world and taken up in glory. Can we just think about that for a minute? That Jesus Christ came, He died, He rose from the grave. That story began to be told. That story began to be spread. Some people didn't believe it at all and some people would say, you know what, I believe that that message can transform my life. It can change who I am. It's a change from the inside that is reflected on the outside, but it's that last line that, that catches me, taken up in glory. I want you to imagine yourself as one of the angels for just a moment. You've been serving at the throne of God for eternity or for as long as the time that God has created you. You're an angel. You have worshipped Him. You have proclaimed, holy, holy, holy. You've been part of an angelic choir for centuries. You have watched the world be formed. You have seen the Son of God in all of His glory beside God the Father. And one day they come and tell you, um, we're letting you angels know that the Father has a plan for the Son. Oh, what's that? What glorious plan do you have? Well, He's going to become a human being. He's what? Yes, the Father is announcing that the Son is going to become human, fully God and fully human, and He's going to go live on the earth. He is? What's that going to look like? And the day comes and the conception happens inside Mary, and the baby grows, and the day comes when Jesus Christ is born, and the angels just erupt with praise. Now, you're an angel, right? So for the next, we believe Jesus lived on this earth 33 or 34 years for 30 Three or 34 years, you watch him grow from a baby into a toddler, into a little boy, into a teenager, into a young man, and finally at the age of 30, becoming a full-fledged rabbi with his own authority to teach and to proclaim truth. And the angels are going, yes, he did it. It's great. And then for the next three, three and a half years, he begins to, to gather a following with the 12 disciples and many other people who followed him. And the angels are watching and go, boy, he's amazing. And they watch what he does. But they watch the opposition and the persecution begin to increase. And they say, don't they understand who that is? The angels are in heaven. And, and if they were allowed to watch, so I'm creating this out of my own imagination because I'm watching this last phrase. And if the angels had a chance to watch what Jesus Christ was doing on earth, they, they would have said, don't these people understand? And as the opposition increased and the day of Jesus Christ's resurrection got close, what do you think the angels were thinking as they watched this? They're beating the Son of God. They're torturing the Son of God. And as they watched this unfold, and then they watched as He was nailed to the cross, and He was lifted up, and they watched Him say those final words, it is finished, and He gave up His spirit, and He was gone. What do you think happened to the angels at that point? Shock, horror, sadness. Maybe God the Father was explaining it all along, but again, we're, we're trying to speculate on what feelings the angels had. They took His body off the cross, and they laid Him in that tomb. 
And for three days, nothing happened. Until the resurrection day, and Jesus Christ burst forth from that tomb. And he came, and he was alive. And can you imagine the celebration that happened in heaven? And Jesus came, and he was on the earth for another 40 days, instructing his disciples, making appearances to a variety of people. And here's what I want you to, to finally imagine. On the day when Jesus went back to heaven, do you remember it in the book of Acts? He was there with his disciples and a few others on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus gave his final words, and he began to rise from their sight. Do you remember that verse? He rose until a cloud hid him from their view, and he was gone to them. But you're an angel for a moment. What were you feeling as Jesus comes into view to re-enter the kingdom of God, the presence of his Father? And you watch him as Jesus Christ gets the reception of his Father, welcome home, son, well done. Do you think that if you were an angel watching Jesus Christ come back into the presence of his Father, you would say, oh, that's boring. Yeah, glad to have you back. I think that in heaven there was a celebration unlike any celebration. I think there was cheering. I think there was singing and dancing and celebration among the angels. That when it says here, taken up in glory, instead of just reading that as a few verses, you say, I wonder what the glory in heaven was like when Jesus Christ returned and sat at the right hand of his Father. I think whatever that was like for Paul and whatever was going on in his mind, Paul is just exalting in the fact of how glorious Jesus Christ is and what he did. And I think he's just amazed that God would use Jesus Christ to become the head of the church and we, Gentiles and Jews alike, become part of the body of Jesus Christ, the living and breathing body, hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And he breaks out into this song and a song of praise. And right here in the middle of this letter, he's been talking about difficulties and leadership and men and women in different places. And he goes, and as I think about who you are and what you have done, I can't contain my Myself, I have to write a song to try to express it. It's not a long song, but it's a profound song. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Last night when I was going through my notes and preparing for this class, I had written down the words to a song that we like to sing in America. You may sing it here in Russian. But I, I found out that I had it on my iPod, and I, I took my iPod out, and I put my ear, earbuds in, and I started to listen to this song and I wish I could play it for you now, but I'll give you the words in just a minute. But as I was listening to the words and the music, tears were coming to my eyes because I had just gotten done studying the passage that I just shared with you. And all of a sudden, this joy and this celebration came over me. And I'm not saying that the song I'm about to share with you or the words to the song come out of this verse, but it fits so very well. And here's what the words of this song say. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. And then the chorus goes, so here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether worthy, altogether lovely, altogether wonderful to me. The second verse goes, King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. All for love's sake became poor. And then the chorus, so here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. 
There's a little section after that, which they repeat three times. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Someday we'll sing a chorus or a song in the presence of God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. I don't know if the words will be like this or Paul's words, but I tell you what, we have a chance to have a taste of that now. The church of Jesus Christ is alive. And every one of us here has a chance to serve the body of Christ in the ways in which God has gifted and enabled us to do. And at the end of that service, uh, there are times when we just say, Lord, I just want to stop and praise you for how great you are. I hope that every one of us can savor that truth. That brings us to the end of this particular section and to the end of chapter 3. We'll take a short break. And when we come back, we'll continue with chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. So let's take a break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.